Good evening, this is Lisa Picker, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Carroll County Public Library's special event tonight, The Art of Rhea Rugs with Melinda Bird. Melinda Bird grew up in Concord, Massachusetts, about a half hour drive from her grandparents in Northborough. In the 1950s, they were among the first in the United States to import Swedish supplies for the Rhea rug making craft through their business, Lundgren Rhea. From them, Melinda absorbed the art of designing Rhea wall hangings and rugs. She designed and made her first when she was in the sixth grade. She worked alongside her grandparents for years and has continued in this Nordic art form her whole life. In addition to being a Rhea designer and a diverse visual artist, Melinda served for over 20 years as an interpreter of nature. She was a seasonal ranger in Colorado, worked with school children at Massachusetts Audubon, and then taught in nature centers in Carroll County, Maryland. Her honed interpretive skills are now shared with you and her students. Melinda established Bird Call Studio in 2000 as an answer to her calling to creativity. Before her total immersion in reviving the art of Rhea, she spent over a decade painting, carving, creating woodcuts and lino cuts and hand printing on clothing. Many of us have t-shirts she has done ourselves in our wardrobes. Some of her shirts art can be found in the Bird Call Etsy shop online. Her passion for this art form has convinced her that re-energizing the Rhea rug craft is her special purpose in life. She lives in Woodby, Maryland with her husband, John, and their Black Lab Gypsy. She is passionate about nature, gardening, creating, and eating delicious foods, and even brewing her own beer. What can this woman not do? Uh, you can follow her studio online at her Bird Call Studio. We'll post some contact information um, on our Facebook feed for you. And Melinda is going to be interviewed tonight by Carroll County's own Ted Zalewski. He is an avid reader and friend of our library, as well as being the county's director uh, for budget and finance analysis. Ted, I think I got that wrong. I apologize. Close enough. Uh, after the interview tonight, uh, we will be taking questions on uh, the Carroll County Public Library's live Facebook page stream. We'll be monitoring the questions and answers in the comments there, and we'll get to them at the end of our program. So Ted, take it away. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I've done a number of author interviews, but this one is going to be different for a number of reasons. First, it's the first time I'm doing it remotely rather than sitting face to face with somebody in an audience. It's also different because I've known Melinda for a long time, about 25 years, I figure. Yep. And I proofread the book that we're going to be talking about, which I've never done before for an interview. And uh, Joanne, my wife, is part of the story. And if you look over my shoulder, you can see her Rhea rug that she did with Melinda. So this book, Rhea Rugs, Designed to Make Your Own, is part history, it's part Melinda's memoir, and it's part of Rhea Rug how-to. For those watching who aren't already familiar with Rhea Rugs, just hang on, you'll be learning a lot as we just go through this interview. Now on the how-to part, we're not gonna have time to get very deep into this, but the book tells you everything you need to know. It can take you from design to knotting to how to take care of the rug once you, are, once you own it. Now, the, the big story here, I think, is about the near death of an ancient craft and art and a nearly miraculous recovery from that near death. Before we get to that point, though, I think we need a little bit of history to give you some context. So Melinda, could you tell us some about your grandparents, their business, and the young Melinda? <laughs> yeah. Um, and Rhea Ruggs went way back before my grandparents, back to the Viking days. But it was, um, it was right about the time I was born, which was in the mid-50s, where my grandparents, well, I'll tell you a little story. I mean, rather than cut it too short, they invited a Swedish man 
to their house for dinner, Thanksgiving dinner. And they had a wonderful time. They became friends. And when the man went back to Sweden and he owned um, a company that, that exported Swedish supplies, he sent them a gift of a rear rug. And they were elderly. I mean, they, <laughs> they were in their 60s, just like I am. But um, they, they became the, um, the sole distributors in the United States for this company. And so that was the year I was born. And so I, um, they kept it up. They, they, they sold to thousands of people around the United States, kind of like I'm doing right now, um, teaching about RIA and, and where it had been only on looms up until about World War II. It was after World War II that the Nordic countries started to prepare kits and designs for RIA rugs that they sent around the world so anybody could make them. And they didn't have to be of Scandinavian descent. They could, anybody could get a backing in yarn and make a Rhea rug. So um, I, I was an artist as a kid, a nature lover. They, uh, my grandparents kind of knew that I was the one to, um, with the art, artistic ability. <laughs> so, um, so come time when they needed help and they were getting up in their 80s, they asked me if I would help them. This is after college. I designed for them. Well, they taught me a lot of things I didn't know, but I had a lot of art skills that they didn't have. So we worked pretty well together, but it was a dying art at that time. And I think anybody will, will agree that um, what had been so huge back in the 1950s and the 60s and early 70s was just suddenly starting to not be around anymore. It wasn't featured in the magazines anymore that were all about fashion and, and Scandinavian design just kind of kind of fell. But um, so I went on to other things. So I got married in 1982. Um, John and I moved to Maryland. My mother started to run the Rhea rug business with my grandparents at that point. And it just was, there was no internet. So there's no way to reach people. And the only way was through advertising in magazines, which cost so much and the payback was too little. So it was, it was sold out of my, my, my grandmother died, my grandfather died before her. And then my mother said, Melinda, if you don't want this business to run now, we're gonna get rid of it. And so I said, hey, I'm a naturalist in Maryland now. I'm, I'm happy, I'm doing what I wanna do, let it go. So it was gone for 30 something years from my hands, but things changed. You told a story about your grandmother that I really liked when you brought a new electronic calculator into the business. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. As a matter of fact, I happen to have a prop. I, I, am a, I count on calculators for everything. I'm not very good at math. And I had a little calculator just like that. And I would, my grandmother would start multiplying 300 times, you know, 493. And she would hand, do it longhand, and I'd just go tap, tap, tap. Grandma, this is what it is. And she would, she would, you're right, the calculator's right. And every time she was surprised, the calculator's right once again. So, so you, never got her, you never got her to change. Oh, no. Long, I mean, I still have all the folders with all of her notes, and everything's written out in longhand on every page. And there's one other story back from your grandmother time. Uh, you had a favorite game that you liked to play at their house. Yeah, um, this really was fun. It, my grandparents had um, yarn all over their um, their basement in, in compartments, and they had 140 or so colors. So my brother and I, in particular, made a game where one of us would sneak into the yarn room, pull out a random skein of yarn, hand it to the other one, and the other one would look at it and run and see how fast they could put it back in the right place. And it was just like, oh, where, oh, here it is. And like, oh, okay, my turn. And so then the, we just go back and forth and it was a good way to develop a sense of color, color appreciation, I think. It was fun. My grandparents probably didn't enjoy it quite as much, but, but we'd left it in pretty good shape. I think I can say with great confidence that I don't know anybody else who ever played that game. <laughs> Although my sister read the book and she said, I remember that game and we played it all the time. So. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, so um, we moved a little bit through history. We're getting closer to that near death of Rhea time. 
And uh, you had continued to make Rhea rugs. In fact, um, I've told you about this, you didn't remember it, but my first exposure at the nature center that you worked, you had maybe a half a dozen Rhea rugs hanging in a big meeting room in there. And I had yeah. no idea at the time what, what they were. I forgot about that. <laughs> so the materials were dwindling. You weren't able to find them anymore. Now they're trying to remember exactly how this played out, but um, Joanne was part of a small group of people that you got together, I think to use up nearly the end of the supplies, but then you had one backing left after that? Um, you know, I was trying to think of exactly the timing there. And when I made the rug that's on the cover of the book, I had that made before they had that class. And I, I was thinking that was my very last backing, but I think I got five more. And so I decided to invite five friends and the criteria was I had to be someone that I really liked and it had to be someone who had shown interest in rear rug making because it was a lot of energy to share this skill. And I wanted people to be really happy. And so Joanne and four other friends all came and we got together and it was, I didn't have much yarn. I had been buying some from the woman who had bought my grandparents' business and I could get some yarn from her. Uh, but I was running low, and so this was going to use up all my backings. I was going to have zero backings and then minimal yarn, you know, so, but that changed. <laughs> so at that point, you had done the Tree of Life, which you thought was going to be your last Rhea rug. Yes. Your, your group of friends used up what you thought was the last of the supplies, and as far as you knew at that point, that was it. It, it was done. That's true. That's true. Um, okay, but we know there's more to the story. Yeah, there you know, is. And as I was reading through some of the history, I was thinking, you know, a number of things had to happen for this recovery to even be possible. You know, uh, you talk about some Scandinavian groups back around 1900 that did some work to preserve the art as we went through the age of industrialization. If they hadn't done that, maybe you would have never known. Well, and there was a that's true. Swedish. That's I'm, I'm a, new, a newcomer here, so a, a lot went on without my presence, and that's for sure. And about 100 years ago, there was a Swedish Rhea club that saved the Rhea sheep, without which there's no wool. And, and they still are very active in trying to keep the sheep alive. I mean, thriving on s small farms throughout Sweden. They're called Rhea Clubben, the, the Rhea Sheep Club. And... Um, yeah, they're, they're very particular about what exactly the, the breed of the sheep and not letting it cross with other sheep. Um, the, the fleece is actually like 13 inches long and um, they have, there's a special mill in Sweden that, and it requires a special spinning device that further apart, the spinner parts are further apart than any place else for other wool because the sheep's fleece, the staple is so long. There's only one company, one family that runs it. So it's, it's a challenge. And, and the companies, all the companies that ran the Swedish Rhea supplies when I was involved back in the 70s um, of Sweden no longer are there. I mean, there's one company that still makes a yarn. In Norway, Brauma in Norway is still producing backing kits and yarn. They're not really promoting it much and that's where I'm really hopping in to say, hey, let me do it because, or let's other people do it because this is what's going to keep it alive, I think. Um, not much happening in Denmark where it used to be very active. And Finland um, is very active right now and, and becoming more and more active as time goes on. So it's pretty exciting. Then in the 1950s, there was a, a multi year tour of Scandinavian design in North America, which you speculated led to a resurgence of interest that probably led to your parents' business. Yeah, my grandparents, yeah. Grandparents. Yeah. Um. So those things all had to have happened. But then when we came to the moment that we were just talking about, where you thought it was done, yeah. Ken Coons walked into the picture. Can you tell yeah. us about Ken and his, his role here? Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember when Ken first Ken Coons first saw the Rhea rugs, but he knew that this was something that was so different from other um, art forms. And he all, and I had told him that, yeah, it's kind of a dying art. It used to be well known and now nobody knows about it. Um, 
and he said, you know, you, let, let's do a handcrafted traditions video. Because he did a series of them um, where he did a video and a newspaper uh, multi-page story with lots of pictures and an article. So we use the, um, the design, the um, tree of life. I, I mean, I designed it with him taking a picture of me sketching the design. It took about a month of filming every few days or a couple times a week. And, um, and he put it as a video. It's about a 10 minute video. Anybody can see it on YouTube. And all of a sudden, um, he was saying, I can't believe the number of views this is hitting, that this is getting. And it's, right now it's, I think, 600,000 views. And, um, and that's like way more than all of his other videos combined. So he's, he, he's the one that said to me, you really ought to think about writing a book. And I said, you know, th there's got to be a lot more out, people out there who know way more than I do. I'm, I just learned from my grandparents and I'm picking up new things now and then. But, and then I couldn't find anybody who, who was doing it. And when I Googled Rhea Ruggs, it all came to me as an artist. And it made me nervous. And I finally decided that this might be my calling. Um, uh, I, hey, on, um, back on Ken for a second. Now, when he first proposed this idea to you, what was your reaction to it? My reaction was, what is the point of getting people excited about this fantastic craft that is so addictive and beautiful and rich in so many ways if there are no supplies and that people will be contacting me They'll want to do it. And I'll say, sorry, I can't help you. I can just tell you about it. I can demonstrate. But so why get people excited if they can't do it? And he said, um, he said, but if we document it and if you demonstrate and you teach what you know, and at least it's on that 10 minute video, that could be enough to, to save it. So when someone does revive it someday, there, there is something for them to refer back to. So who was right, Melinda? Ken was right. <laughs> I mean, everything's changed since then. And, um, and he's, he is very sharp with computers. And um, he had taken all these pictures of, for the book. And he said, if you write the book and do the, do the word document of the book, I can lay it out so that it could just go and get, get printed. And I said, well, that's good, because I want nothing to do with the t technical aspects of putting a book together. But I wrote it, and I wrote it, and I wrote it. And it took me eight years, maybe nine. I say eight, but it's really more like nine. And, and the, But I wasn't just writing. I was also finding resources and starting to buy those resources. And I was being contacted every day by people around the world saying, I need supplies. I need needles. I need graph paper. I need backing. And it, everything just kind of unfurled. I found the yarn guys in Illinois. They are the... Um, they are the distributors for Rauma in Norway. So through them, I get all my yarn and my backings and my kits. So now I have a full studio with all their supplies. So I was writing a book and filling orders and doing all the other things in life that I like to do. So it was pretty, um, it was pretty busy for a while. But finally, at the last minute before this coronavirus hit, <laughs> we got the book done in, in my hands. And they've been moving very well. Now, you mentioned uh, somewhere along the way there, you know, after the video and then after you started doing things, people contacting you around the world on, on, by internet. Right. You know, we talked about some of the things that had to happen for you to be in position to save Rhea. Another one, though, is the internet. Without that, oh, everything yeah. else could have happened and just, we couldn't have done nope. this. The internet was huge. And um, I couldn't have even put the word out there at all without the internet. And no one could find me. And all you have to do is Google Rhea Rugs, and it just goes to like a. Well, at first it was almost nothing. Um, Ten years ago, almost nothing came up, and now there's a ton of stuff. And and I am I am among every picture on the Google search. My my hands making knots, things I sell, um, artwork, even mostly people that I've connected with that that. Um, that send me pictures of their work and I, I put them out there. I say, whatever you send me, I'm gonna share. So don't be, you know, if, you're, if you don't want me to share your picture, don't send it to me. So. 
So you decided to say Maria, and you've said, after I made that decision, my life would never be the same. Yeah. So, so tell us how your life has changed. Well, when I, before I made the video, I was very content as an artist and growing as an artist and loving everything I did. And I had a nice following for my work, my, mostly my printmaking work. And I just kept thinking of where I was gonna go next in life in that way. So when Rhea, once I jumped off the cliff and into the Rhea world, I knew that it was just gonna get bigger and bigger because people were starving for more information. There was like the people, there were the people who already knew a little bit about it or their grandparents used to do it. And then there were people who had never heard of it before. And they, they saw the video and they would say, I've never seen this before. I can tell this is my art form. I am already in love with this craft. Get me started. So there's like the whole spectrum of uh, abilities. And I've met people who are extremely professional and make it their living in one way or another. I, I feature several of them in the book and um, uh, a, lot, a lot's changed. And I know it has to be a priority and to be honest, like even with this, the coronavirus going on right now, and I think, what if something happened to me? Who is going to sell my books? And that actually, it actually really scared me for like one day when I, I wasn't feeling really well. And it was allergies, but it was like, there's too much to do still. And I'm really looking for more people to step up to sharing it, teaching it, supplying people, um, keeping it alive and not just not just me. And I know in Finland, there are some really active, wonderful people who are keeping it alive. And they have websites and Facebook pages, and they are all in the book. And I highly recommend people you know, subscribe to them so they can see what's going on around the world. And they do sell to the, the United States. So um, yeah, it's kind of a pressure of how do I carry this on? How do other people carry it on? The and books to come help. back to that idea in uh, in a few minutes, but you know, on how your life changed. You know, Ken Coots um, has a quote where he observed a change in your life. You know, he said, uh, "Now, when you hear Melinda talk about growing up in a Rhea family, the sadness is gone." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, good. Um, I I, I kind of missed what that last thing you just said there, but oh. like the sadness being gone. Right. He said, "Now, when you." When you talk about growing up in a Rhea family, the sadness is gone. So I yeah. think you saw sadness earlier. Well, the sadness was when I would say, but then the love, then everybody didn't know about it anymore and people stopped buying it and latch hook, latch hook was invented and all the people were buying latch hook kits and thinking that they were making a real Rhea rug. And it was, and that was the sad part that, that it was, it was falling off the face of the earth in the United States and, and in other countries too, I am learning. But um, so the sadness was the, the downfall of it, but not growing up in the family of Rhea, because that, that was fun. And that was, I always felt special. My mother was always making a rug, probably just to have a new rug for my grandparents' shows when they would have a show. So you talked a little bit about uh, Ken suggesting writing the book and then you thinking about, uh, the need, there's a need to be filled there. Yeah. But when, you, when you first thought about this, apparently you had the idea that you were going to write this little booklet off the top of your head. Yes. And then it turned into this eight or nine year project. A 300 page book almost. Yeah. Um, I had written a, a pamphlet that went out with all the kits that I sold with my, with my grandparents sold that I had prepared for them. And the pamphlet was pretty good but it was all about their supplies only and their backing only. And so I thought if I just start with a, a, that little pamphlet and then just kind of beef it up, we'll have a good booklet. But I just kept meeting fan, fascinating people who kept telling me more of a story and more of a story. And even now, I mean, when I put it out to press, I felt like there is so much more, but how much more time do I want to spend of my life just to keep it going as a book when at least it's out there and the story can still continue through social media um, and other ways. But um, 
there's, a, there's still a lot to be told. There are other people writing books, um, which, which is very exciting. I do feature one written by a, a Finnish woman in the book. And um, there just has to be more, more shows, more sharing, more classes. Okay, so you've, you've changed the real world. We're living in a new world than we were a decade ago. Well, I don't know if I've changed it or I've just been kind of among the, the small group of people who have been changing it. So, but the book will help. I mean, definitely that helps. Uh, I'll say you've changed it, even if you don't. <laughs> okay. Can now I'm, embar I'm embarrassed for certain people around the world watching it thinking, oh, she thinks she's changed the world. <laughs> but you know, well, it's, it's not all about you, but I mean, you well, made some things happen. True. Yeah. Yeah. So you've talked some about the state of Rhea sheep in the world now, which is important. And you've talked some about the suppliers of yarn and backings, which of course is, is critical. And you've kind of hinted at this a little bit, but there's a growing network of people uh, around the world uh, who are playing various roles in this. And one thing that you've really tried to promote is finding people to act as mentors for uh -huh. other people who are getting into Rhea. And I know yeah. you actually have a, a, a map where you, where you have uh, people marked. <laughs> yeah, a map on my wall. It's in every newsletter that I send out so people can look at the newsletter. Um, I, I have a little white slip of paper for everybody who has bought Rhea rug making supplies from me. And there's a couple hundred and some people I don't really know. I mean, maybe they bought yarn or maybe they bought needles, but I don't really know them as a Rhea rug maker and they might not even be on the map. So there's, let's say a couple hundred little white tags. And then I started to think, you know, what if someone in the next town needs to be taught how to do the knot because they've forgotten. And I, and I look at the, I look at the map and I think, oh, well that, you know, that guy, he's really good at it. I, I'm sure he'd help you. So I call the person and say, would you help this person? Oh yeah, send them over. So then I asked for mentors. And so I think we have 23 right now, not just in the United States and, um, and those are people who just are happy to be contacted if anybody has a question. Not to teach a whole class in rear rug making, but just anything that a person could be perplexed at. Something, something just doesn't feel right about their knot or, or they find a, an old kit in the closet of a deceased relative and they don't know what to do with it. Well, I'm in Maryland and so people coming here is not that easy, but I can find somebody within a state that would help anybody with anything. And, and also in Sweden and Finland, um, the Netherlands, England, so in, in Mexico. <laughs> hey, Angie. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, there's, there's there are mentors everywhere. And, um, and I want more, I can't, I really would like to convince more people to sign up to be a mentor. I don't put out their phone number or their address. I just say their name and that, so someone can say, I would like to talk to that mentor near Tucson and then I would just connect the two of them. And part of this is you only have so much time you can only help so many people so this is a force multiplier. Yeah. And I think it also ties back to something you said earlier you know how does this keep going you know who's going to carry this on some right. of these people hopefully will will be the answer. Yeah I'll have to turn my map over to somebody <laughs> <laughs> but seriously I'm it's important. And why should somebody start from scratch again? And I, I skipped over back when you were talking about the starting the, the book, uh, a person I think was kind of important in the why am I doing this? Uh, you, you met again through the internet, a um, lady named Mia Ellis daughter. Yes. Talk about her and her story a little bit. Yeah. Mia and I have become good friends on Facebook, but what meant so much to me at a time when I didn't even know if I had any business writing a book on real rug making was she saw the video at the same time that, that someone had given her an, a kit that wasn't made and she didn't know how to make it. She went to run, around to the library looking for a book on the subject and asking, how do I make a real rug? And she couldn't find it, then she Googled it. And then she found my little video. And from that, she was able to figure out how to make it. And so she emailed me just to say, your video helped me. And, and then I thought, how odd it is that I am carrying on what my Swedish grandfather taught me that he learned from Swedes. And now 
I am teaching a Swedish woman who can't find anybody who can help her. And anyway, she finished her rug. She, she has, there's a story in the book about her and um, just, yeah, just a really delightful woman. And I'm, we've been, she's wants me to come visit and we, I'm going to, I'm just sort of waiting for the, mm, the health scare to end or slow down. But yeah, I mean, I will say that people like Mia have given me so much, which is what kept me going through, through all these years is just knowing that, that there are so many stories to be told and so many answers to questions that I, I could share. And mostly I was finding the information from somebody and passing it on and putting it in the book as not my idea, but somebody else's idea. Um, I know there's danger in trying to just pick out a couple people to talk about, but I wonder yeah. if maybe a few few others that you've met, and I thought <sighs> well, maybe you could start with your rug making friend, John, who, who died recently. Yeah, I told Ted about this because it really hit me hard. Um, and I'm gonna share this because people, I write a blog and John Terzakis um, was in the past um, few blog, past couple of blogs over the past six months or so because he has a daughter in California who once wanted to keep him happy and he was always happy with a rear rug in his hand. So she would, Come up with a design. She contacted me one day and said, "She said, can you can you design something like this for my father? He made one already, but he wants a different one, and I want it like this." And, and I said, "Elizabeth, I am writing this book." And she was also an author, so I think she understood this writing thing. And I said, "I can't take the time to design it for you. I can do it, but then the book's another month, you know a few weeks pass. So let tell you what, let me send you pages from my book." that are not, not finished yet, but you can maybe help me. So I would send her the pages from the book and she would do the design and she would order supplies, actually come up with exactly how much yarn her father would need. And I would send him the supplies in New Jersey and he would make a rug. And this happened, I think through three or four rugs, it was great. And he would always call and say, oh, I need two more skeins of this. And I said, oh, I bet you need more than that. Okay, make it three. So we just had these fun conversations and then I had talked with him, um, this is just, well, I talked with him um, at, at the end of March and he was fine, he was taking care of himself, he was socially distancing himself and everything. And then at the end of the week, his daughter Elizabeth emailed me and said, um, we we're so sad that dad passed very suddenly from the coronavirus. And it just really, I mean, this was like a, a friend. Many of my friends I've never met but I feel like I know them. And he was special to the Rhea community because he was just a cute guy who made beautiful big Rhea rugs and his daughter helped him. And it was a, it was a great story for my blogs. Please, anybody who is interested, go to the blogs and read about John Terzakis and his daughter, Elizabeth. <sighs> and anybody else that uh, pops out is a really interesting new relationship? Well, actually so many pop into my head, it's hard to really pick out one in particular. Um, but you, you've done a good job at picking out a couple of the most fun ones. But um, you know, this, there is this lady in Finland that I'm, I'm really intrigued with because she, she is reviving the rug, well, just putting a whole new thought spin in Finland for Rhea rug making and she's teaching online and she's extremely computer literate, which I'm not. And um, she'd made a program where she, you can take a photograph and convert it through her software program to make, make a graph for Rhea. And it even picks out the yarn colors and figures out how much yarn you need. And she just got an award from Finland. Her name is Jenny Van Hainen. And she also is carrying my books now. I just shipped her um, three big cases of books and which, is wonderful because it costs a lot to send them out individually and it takes a long time to get there. So um, anyway, um, I'm really excited for her work and and I can connect people to her now. And she, not that she needs it because she has, she's teaching online classes to a hundred people at a time. Um, so uh, Finland's in good hands. Now, not to overcommit uh, Melinda before she's ready, but I know she's, given at least some casual thought to the possibility of teaching Rhea rug making online. 
Mm -hmm. Those of you who are listening who might be interested in that, you know, if you went to her website and uh, and let her know, maybe she can judge if that's something she wants to take on or not. Yeah, I, I know I can do that once I kind of master this whole Zoom thing. Um, and I will for sure. Um, I'd like to share too about um, the, some of the computer connections, how people can keep in touch. Is, is this a good time, Ted? Sure. Um, there, I have a Facebook page called Bird Call Studio and I have a Facebook group at Bird Call Studio called, Bird Call Studio, Rhea Rug Friends. And it has about 230 or so members from all around the world who are just interested in sharing about Rhea, Rhea Rug Making. Many beginners, many advanced people, some people weave their own backings, some people weave their own whole Rhea's as it was done originally um, all through the centuries. Um, and, and one reason I started that was to lighten my burden of having to answer every question that came down the line, or sometimes I didn't even know the answer anyway. So you put it out in the universe a little bit through a, a Facebook group and somebody knows the answer or they get, you get a lot of dialogue going. So um, that's a really good way people can connect. And, um, and, and con connecting through my website works, it has a contact page. Um, I have an Etsy shop called Bird Call, and all the things I have ready to go out right now are in that shop. And it's quite a few Rhea rug supplies and backings and yarn and samples. Um, oh, but probably the best thing is for people to sign up for the newsletter, because that really tells them everything. That'll make them feel connected with the Rhea world. And you can sign up so it appears in your email automatically. It does. And I also put it on Facebook on the Burkhall Studio site, just for people who haven't bothered to sign up for it. <laughs> okay, now I, I embarrassed you a little bit earlier when I talked about your impact on the Rhea world. <laughs> Let me go back to two things you've said that will uh, show you are humble of, about your role in all this. Um, there's one thing, you know, as far as the business goes, uh, you've made a comment that you don't want to be a monopoly. You you want to see other businesses appear and thrive. I do. I really do. They make my life so much easier. And then, um, and the other thing, uh, you're talking about how people can help Rhea grow, and and you end the little section with a, a quote where you're saying, "You, the reader, can you know you will make a difference," is what you you say. Uh, so clearly yeah. this is not somebody who thinks it's all about her, but it is about how do I get this to others? Yeah, well, that is that is important to me. That, that is how the book winds up at the end with all the things people can do because there is so much. I mean, people don't think about <clears throat> what they can do, but even if all they know how to do is make a kit, knowing how to make the knot is what almost nobody else knows how to do. So get out in the public to do it, go to a, um, a, a knitting circle where everybody's knitting and sit there with your Rhea rug in your lap. You know, it, it's only, in, it brightens the day of whoever's in the room next to you because they'll be so intrigued by it. Um, submitting the, your work to um, county fairs and um, art, art competitions, and just kind of get it out so people, well, so people know that the word is pronounced Rhea instead of Raya, it's just a way of of just getting the word out there and and to get people to, to touch it and say, oh my gosh, I, I thought I knew this craft, but once I see it and feel it, I realize that they have no idea what it is. So it gets people talking about it, just sharing. Now, I said, you know, we wouldn't have much time to get into kind of the how-to stuff. And, and I still think that's, that's true, but it's one aspect of it I wanted to talk a little bit about, and that's just kind of, not a design, not in the sense of specifically how do you go about doing it, but some, some of the ideas. And um, there was one person in your book. Oh, where'd my note go? She said, um, pa painting in wool is what she, she called it. She you called know, my it. grandmother would say that, oh, okay. it's painting in wool. And that is so true. And and I think it's an interesting thing that uh, you know, it's a painting in the sense that I think you have the opportunity to do very nuanced things. You can 
yeah. you can make very subtle changes in, in what you're doing. Yeah. One of the things that allows you to do that is, and here is a little bit of the how-to, you're putting three threads on a needle. Right. Threads can be different colors. Exactly. And I thought was really interesting, you know, with, um, with three different colors on any one needle, you can have 10 different combinations. It, imagine what you could do with 150 colors. I mean, there's just millions of combinations possible. So you can paint a spectrum by having, let's say three all of one color, but then if another half inch over two of one of that color and one of a slightly different color and just kind of, and that's when the paint effect comes in. Just like an artist would dip their brush into a paint and dab it into another color paint and mix. And, and you can also design by painting with paint on graph paper. And then, and then looking at the graph paper and deciding what colors you're going to put in it, your paint on the graph paper tells you where to put them because it's sitting right there in the graph paper. So um, I think that's probably one of the best qualities of Rio rug making is the, the color blending. And you can't do it with one strand plugged in and another strand plugged in, but you put three together and it's rich and it glows. Rio yarn tends to glow because it's rich in lanolin and long long fibers that just reflect light in different ways. Yeah. And there's a um, part where you're talking about this and you start talking about mixing different color threads and what things might look good or, or not look good. But there was, there was a quote from you that I, I really like. You, know, you talked about using a single thread that doesn't quite seem to match as a whisper of something happening here. <laughs> yeah, unexpected, surprise. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's something people will figure out, but they'll, they'll be looking at their yarn thinking, oh, these, these three colors really clearly go together, but here I am coming to another area and I want it to, I either want it to clash, you know, like hit like this, this color and this color, or I want to soften it and just, so if it's, let's say this is the orange and this is the blue, well, they're never going to look like they might blend, but if you put some area of orange and blue mixed together, it softens it so it looks like blue paint spilling into the orange paint and the color just becoming mud maybe or whatever, but it's like it definitely has life and something unexpected. Yeah. And in the book, you can actually see Melinda doing some watercolors that lead to rugs. And you can also see her playing around with different combinations of threads, actually with her fingers twisting threads and saying, well, look at this combination and this combination. Yeah, yeah. That's always a big question in classes. Does, does this work? That's the way. Does this work? It works in, for some purposes, but not for others. So it depends on what you're trying to do here. So I try to cover that in the book. I try to hit a lot of things in the book from what I learned from my students in classes. The things that puzzle people is the interesting stuff for a book. Yeah, now it could be Melinda would not agree with every color combination people will come up with, but a, but a theme throughout her book is, it's your rug, do what you want. Yeah, yeah, don't look at me and say, is this good? You know, what is good? Do you like it? You, you feel charged up by it? Yeah. And people are in different stages in their artistic development. So a flower in a flower pot could be a perfectly beautiful rug. And I've seen them very beautiful. But that, that same artist might gravitate to like, you know, looking inside of the iris flower or something and just creating more of a abstract that would be more to my taste because I like abstracts. But um, it's, it all depends on where the person is and where they're, where they're going, where they want to go, and who they're trying to please, if anybody but themselves. Now, you do talk a good bit about Rhea rugs lending themselves more to abstract than to uh, realistic looking things. But you kind of um, tie the two together. I thought you had a really interesting idea where you take a empty 35 millimeter slide, mm -hmm. uh, hoping there's people listening that still know what 35 millimeter slides are. Yeah. You, you can put that on a photograph of something real, but isolate a small part of it that becomes something more abstract. Yeah. You know, I have a slide. I'm going to try to, 
put up here that shows exactly, actually that very same picture from the book that you're talking about. And let's just see if I can get that to share. Um, okay, let's see if, it, if we can show that. Can you see that? Yep. So we have a, a duck. This is from an Audubon magazine. And this is a slide frame. And I just held the, I, I moved the, the frame around on the feathers until I saw something that was exciting to me. And somebody else would stop at some other image and it, that might be exciting to them, but the frame, and that's a, sort of a nice typical size that uh, people might be apt to, to use. You wanna see another one? Sure. Oh, now I know how to click around. Okay, here is another photograph. It's actually from a magazine. It's a flower called Purple Loose Strife. And you see the little frame I made? It's just paper and I taped it on there and I picked out colors of yarn, three strands to the needle. And that's the rug that I made from that design. I noticed the little bit of yellow there that didn't seem to fit with all the other colors, but you know, had a part to play. Yeah, it did. To me, it did. Yeah, and that's another thing where you can do, you can keep the smile in your face or the tongue in your cheek and put something somewhere where you like it and you get a smile from it. And other people are going to say, oh, I never expected to see that. And it's just kind of fun to keep it going. Now, no, is another one. I mean, just like if you had a map of a significant place, maybe where where your life changed in some place and you looked closely at the map, well, the lines that form for the topography might be the most beautiful Rhea design that you just re blow it up and put it on a graph paper or draw it right on the backing. You know, it's interesting that you talked about putting something in there just kind of your for your fun. There have been some writers that I've talked to yeah, you know, I've seen things in their book and I've even said, um, was there something important about this or were you just having your, some fun with your book? And, and often the answer is, oh, I was just doing it for myself. <laughs> yeah, why not? Life is too short to do everything for everybody else. So you got to make yourself happy. So Lisa, did we get any questions? So we have a few comments. Um, Carol says she can't wait to make one of these Rhea rugs. Uh, Chris also says that one of that her actual first weaving project was a Rhea wall hanging inspired by living in Sweden as a child. Oh. It was woven on a frame loom. Mm -hmm. uh, she has a six by nine hand woven Rhea she bought at a flea market in Stockholm back in 1995 too. Wow, that's a so treasure. Lots of good memories there. Yeah, and I think I think everyone. Uh, would really love if you were able to share some more photos too, Melinda. Yeah, I'm finally figuring it out. So let's see here. I'm going to go into share and that and okay. So we'll just cruise on that. Whoops, got to go slower. Now this is one that I just created it for the a festival of wreaths for the Carroll County Arts Center wreath fundraiser and it I mean, I've never seen this done before, but just goes to show you can play and just do whatever you want. That might not be in any book. And, and it classes, this one was at Fairhaven. And it's a class is great because you can really see and touch everything and have access to everything at your fingertips. Where when you, if you can't go to a class, you kind of have to order and get it sent to you. And, and it's a little harder, although samples really help. Oops. This is a student, this is like a, a one week class and by the fourth class she designed it, she's already halfway done cutting her loops. This is a woman making her very first knot. This is, a, look at her, um, Linda using yarn to, to section off her design just like her backing is. I mean, you can see on the, the paper there, she has lines drawn and she put them in yarn on her backing and she's kind of winging it. I love it, people do their own ideas. Common ground on the hill. Oh. 
I teach how to do little things like twisting a skein of yarn. One lady who bought the book said, as soon as I got your book, I went through all my yarn and twisted it all into skeins. And this lady was learning and realizing it, it's a little, a little challenging until you get the hang of it. But once you get the hang of it, it's very easy. So this is what a newsletter looks like. Just, I mean, the front page kind of looks like that and it's usually kind of fun. That's, that's a random Google of Rhea Ruggs. And uh, I'd say about 20% of those are mine. <laughs> uh, this is Jenny Van Hainen I was telling you about getting her award for Artisan of the Year. She's very creative and I think she's using all the local Finn sheep, which is just like the Rhea sheep of Sweden. These are the Finnish heritage sheep. And this is the, you see a photograph on one side and the rug that was made through her computer program. Well, a person had to knot the rug, of course, but it's, it, it, did the, it did the graph work for them. So I just want to show that there are other people who are getting out there and, and sharing what they know, keeping Rhea alive. Here's the map. Now this was March 17th, 2020. And Ken and I and my husband went to pick up the books at the um, printer in Odenton. And right there in the parking lot, there was one box that wasn't sealed. And it was just like, it was the biggest joy of my life to hold that book in my hand. I can't even tell you how good it felt. 500 books, we've sold about half. Trying to get the word out. And let's see. Well, I guess I'm gonna stop the share for now. But yeah, thank you for asking that, Lisa. <laughs> if you had a request come in to make your uh, your wreath that you made for the art center to make that into a kit. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about that. It's one that would have to be where people use their own creativity because I was at that point getting rid of yarn because I had so much greens and I put in all colors and I realized when I folded it back and folded it into a circle, I could see the row, the gap in the weave and I didn't, didn't want that. So I just put some big loop-de-loop -loop knots all through the gap. So it'd be more like, here's an idea, here are the materials, make it work. And that, that's how I would teach that. <laughs> if people can handle that. Any other questions? I could click on a few more pictures if you want. Uh, Melinda, also, how can folks get a copy of your book right now? I know it will be in the libraries. We will have it in there. Um, but how else can people get their hands on their own copy? Well, I'm happy to mail one out to anybody who contacts me. Um, they are $49 if we go by the uh, media mail, which is a really good rate. I package it in a nice folding box. It costs $5. So. Um, and then, of course, this tax in Maryland, but um, birdcallstudio.com, my Etsy shop called Bird Call, it's listed there, same price, they can just click on it and, um, and get one. Or if you're in Finland, you can get it from Jenny Van Hainen. Um, the yarn guys in Illinois bought a, a case of them and they're selling them. Um, if you have a bookstore in your community that might want them, they can contact me. And I do sell them, um, I can sell them to stores for um, a wholesale price. And where else? Um, that might be it for right now. But libraries can contact me. And um, it's more about getting it out in the community rather than me just selling books. Because if you can check it out at the library, well, you're probably going to want to have a copy. Then you can order one. But at least you can check it out. It'd be very handy. Good question. Is that it on the questions, Lisa? Taking that as a yes. Oh, uh, we have one last comment okay. here. It's very nice. Kristen says that uh, your book is truly a beautiful one and has everything you need to know about Rhea. And she thanks oh. you, Melinda. <sighs> Thank you, Kristen. Wow. Yeah, I'm getting really good comments and it feels so good. 
because it makes me feel like what I tried to do, I did. And there's still a whole lot more to do. Thank you. Any last thoughts that you want to offer up, Melinda? All I want to say is that it is so much fun to make a rear rug. And the reason that you can believe that is because I had so much fun in all the art forms that I worked in. It was all fun. But this is the one that I've chosen because it it's so rich and the colors just shine and your hands and the smell of it. I mean, it's the it's a whole tactile sensory experience to make a rear rug and then live with it. And I have rugs in my house. Some are 60 years old and older, still actively on the floor and I mean, on the couch and I take it around and I go outside with my dog in the winter nights. I mean, it's, they're easy to live with and pass on to other generations. So give it a try. So Lisa, are, are you gonna talk about uh, possible upcoming events? Yes. Um, well, thank you both Melinda and Ted for joining us this evening. Um, it, it was a thoroughly enjoyable program. This video will be up on our Carroll County Public Library Facebook page after um, this, this ends today. So you'll be able to link to it. You'll be able to watch it again and share it. Um, also, we want to give a shout out to the Community Media Center, the CMC in Carroll County, truly a treasure, truly a great partner, and they are our uh, partner here for streaming and making our live coverage available um, on Channel 19, so we want to thank them. Also, uh, we will be streaming live tomorrow night. Uh, that will be May the 19th at 7 p.m., a special concert with our friends from Wild Harbors. Um, and it'll be a wonderful concert, very interactive. Uh, and then also June 2nd, we have coming up a program with Liv Constantine. And Liv Constantine is actually the pen name of sisters, Lynn Constantine and Valerie Constantine. Uh, their past book was The Last Mrs. Parrish, and Reese Witherspoon had this to say about it, a fun and fast-paced psychological thriller about two determined women who play a high-stakes game of deception that one can only win. I know many of you out there are going through author withdrawal, um, author event withdrawal, and uh, we are preparing a number of events. Um, many of them will be with Ted um, that we'll have more details on soon. So check out our roster of online programming uh, in the coming months. And that's all listed right here on our Facebook page, but also at um, our website, library.carr.org. Once again, thank you, Melinda, and thank you, Ted, for joining us. Ted, do you have any last thoughts? Oh, wow, hadn't thought about last thoughts. Um, just <laughs> encourage, encourage you all to, to check the book out and see if it might be something that uh, inspires you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Take care, everyone. Be well and stay safe.